When in America did the slaughter of over a thousand Jews and the kidnapping, the torture and rape of hundreds more become a matter of small concern? When in America did the atrocities of sociopathic killers become acceptable in America because their victims happen to be Jewish? Is our magnificent experiment in human dignity and freedom, the American experiment, dying as well? Forbid it, almighty God. We need to remember just how rare and precious our experiment is and how a tiny group of outcast Jews cherished, embraced, and helped to midwife the American experiment at the time of its creation. Hi, I'm Pete Fenzel, and this is, in their own words, the story of the American experiment and the words of the people who made it happen. Our episode today is the story of the role of Jewish folks during the American Revolution. As usual, we have to set the stage before we can tell the story. So our story begins in 1654 when Portugal expelled all the Jews from Brazil. And so 16 ships loaded with Sephardic Jewish families left Recife, Brazil, bound for the Netherlands and other Dutch colonies where they expected to find better religious freedom and opportunity to live according to their conscience and their way of life. Pretty much like the pilgrims did 46 years earlier. Of those 16 ships, 15 made it safely to their destinations, but one ship was attacked and captured by Spanish pirates. And they despoiled the 23 Sephardic Jews on board of their wealth and of their belongings and they intended to sell all of the passengers on board and crew as slaves. But a French ship called the Saint Charles intervened, sank the pirate ship and rescued the 23 Sephardic Jews and carried them safely to the port of New Amsterdam, the tiny little settlement at the southern tip of Manhattan that was the Dutch capital of the Dutch colony of New Netherlands. You might say that the Saint Charles was the Jewish Mayflower. The Director General of New Netherlands, Peter Stuyvesant, did not welcome the 23 impoverished Jews with open arms. It was not so much that he was anti-Semitic. He was an equal opportunity bigot. His antipathy also ran towards Puritans and Quakers and Baptists and Lutherans, and he particularly hated Catholics. He had Catholics flogged. Now these 23 Jews persisted and prevailed, and they established the first Jewish congregation in America, Shirith Israel, remnant of Israel. Initially they met for prayer in private homes, but eventually they built a synagogue in 1740 in Lower Manhattan, what was then called Mill Street. And there they worship for quite some time, but their present synagogue of the exact same congregations now exists on West 70th Street and Central Park West in New York City. Meanwhile, up in Rhode Island, Roger Williams had already established the Rhode Island colony. Williams was a Puritan separatist minister who believed fervently that government had no legitimate role to restrain or to prohibit the free exercise of one's religious beliefs. William's convictions were embodied in the Royal Charter granted to the Rhode Island Colony as follows. That our royal will and pleasure is that no person within the said colony at any time hereafter shall be anywise molested, punished, disquieted, or called in question for any difference in opinion on matters of religion. News of the Rhode Island colony's protection of religious freedom spread rapidly among the Sephardim. And so, by 1658, Sephardic Jews from distant places had begun to settle in Newport 
And by the time of the revolution, Newport had become the largest congregation of Jews in America with about 75 families and over 200 souls. Their synagogue, built in 1763, still stands today. Now, many Sephardic Jews were attracted to Philadelphia for its commercial significance as a major seaport, its large population and commercial establishment, and for the religious freedoms granted to Pennsylvania in its colonial charters. In 1740, a Philadelphia Jew named Nathan Levy petitioned the royal proprietor of Pennsylvania for a plot of land in which to bury his child according to Jewish tradition. And from the focal point of this Jewish cemetery grew the congregation Mikveh Israel, the hope of Israel. I'm standing right here at the entrance to the Mikveh Israel Cemetery, the colonial cemetery in which are buried some of the most prominent Jewish folks from the colonial period, including a, a fellow named Hyam Solomon. And we'll talk a bit about Hyam Solomon a little bit later. There were two other major Jewish congregations in America at the time. One was in Charleston, South Carolina, and the other one was in Savannah, Georgia. The Jews settled in both Charleston and Savannah because like Newport and New York and Philadelphia, they were large seaports and commercial centers, but also because their charters granted religious freedoms for Jewish folks as well. So who were these Jews of the American Revolution? Well, they were mostly Sephardic Jews from Spain and Portugal, not Ashkenazi Jews from the ghettos of Europe. They came to America as free people unlike many who came as indentured servants or slaves. They were merchants, ship owners, shopkeepers, international traders, and financiers, and some were extremely wealthy and members of the commercial elites. They were not farmers, although they lived in an agrarian society. Nor were they scholars, lawyers, doctors, architects, or engineers. Nor were they hunters or backwoodsmen, or soldiers. But they dressed the same as non-Jews. They lived in the same kind of houses in the same neighborhoods as non-Jews. They often married non-Jews. They paid the same taxes as non-Jews, had access to the same courts as non-Jews, and received the same justice as non-Jews. They could petition the same political authorities as non-Jews. Their property rights were protected the same as non-Jews. They could assemble and worship freely the same as non-Jews. And there were no special laws against them. They had no hierarchy or ghetto authority, nor was there rabbinical authority at that time because there would be no permanent rabbis in America until the 1840s. And yet through it all, they still maintained their Jewishness and prayed together in faithful congregations. Was there prejudice and bigotry? Of course there was. Ever have there been the vicious and the small-minded people? There still are many today. But when they arrived in America, these Sephardic Jews found a culture that had familiar aspects to it. The Protestant Puritan society was Hebraic in its essence, modeled on the Torah, what Christians call the Old Testament. Strict codes of conduct informed by the Pentateuch and enforced by a homogeneous community of equals characterized colonial life. American colonists were highly literate and well versed in sacred scripture. Many towns and cities carried biblical names from the Old Testament like Salem, Massachusetts, Canaan, Connecticut, Goshen, New York, Bethesda, Maryland. Many American children were named after Old Testament patriarchs and prophets like Benjamin Franklin, Samuel Adams, Nathan Hale, and even Abraham Lincoln. Jews moved easily in this culture. Further example was that in 1753, a bronze bell was cast for the Pennsylvania State House commemorate the 50th anniversary, or the Jubilee, 
of Pennsylvania's Charter of Privileges, which granted self-government and religious freedom to the people of Pennsylvania. A passage from the book of Leviticus about the celebration of the Jubilee by the Israelites was embossed on the circumference of this bell. Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. We know this bell as the Liberty Bell. By the time of the American Revolution, the Jewish population in America was between 1,000 and 1,500 folks out of a total population of three million here. That means that if for every 10,000 Americans, only about five were Jewish, a very tiny part of the population. But the role that they played in their contribution to the success of America's struggle for independence far outweighed what their numbers would otherwise suggest. A substantial majority of American Jews were patriots who supported the American cause in our struggle against Great Britain. Since the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem by the Roman legions and the diaspora of the Jews, wherever they went, Jews were foreigners. But here in America, they found a home, a shining city on the hill where they could live freely and in their own way of life. Jewish patriots were all in and they gave not just of their surplus, but of their substance. About a hundred Jewish men took up arms and were soldiers either in the Continental Army or in the state militias. And this sounds like a small number, but when you consider the small number of, of Jews in the country, this was fairly proportionate to the ratio of those who took up arms for the cause and the total population of America. Whenever British forces advanced, for example, when they captured New York, when they captured Philadelphia, whenever British forces advanced, Jewish congregations fled. And so, in the summer of 1776, when New York was captured by the British, the Shirith Israel congregation fled to Philadelphia, leaving only a, a few Tory members of the congregation be custodians of their synagogue. Wars are fought with blood and treasure, and the new American nation had no treasure. Isaac Moses was a wealthy New York merchant and a ship owner and an ardent patriot who relocated to Philadelphia when New York was captured by the British. He fitted out eight ships as privateers to prey upon British commerce. And he also raised and contributed substantial sums of money for the war effort. And many Jewish merchants extended financial support to our struggle for independence. But a, a little known Jewish influence during the revolution occurred at Valley Forge in the winter of 1777-78. The Continental Army's drill master, Baron von Steuben, had a difficult task to turn a collection of starving farmers into a professional army able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe against British regulars. And so he turned the men's hunger to their advantage by throwing bagels into the air as targets. Back then, bagels did not have holes in the center, and they were rather doughy and undercooked. As an incentive, any soldier who could shoot out the center of the bagel got to keep it and to eat it. And that is how the bagel got its hole. And that, my dear people, is complete hogwash. But it's good hogwash. What is not widely known, however, is the sacrifice, the deeds, and the devotion of a fellow named Haim Solomon, who is America's most significant Jewish founding father. Every American should know about him. Now, Haim Solomon was a Sephardic Jew born in Poland in 1740. He was highly educated and traveled throughout Europe for several years. So he became fluent in five languages and became particularly adept at international trade and finance. He was a Polish patriot and he fled to New York City in 1772 uh, during the first Polish partition. And he amassed significant wealth there as a merchant and financier and quickly became 
a member of the Sons of Liberty in New York. Solomon was an ardent adherent to the American cause. When the British captured New York in the summer of 1776, they arrested Solomon as a spy, and he was confined in the notorious provost jail where he suffered atrocious abuse, abuse from which he never really fully recovered. Eventually, he was paroled because of his linguistic skills as an interpreter between the British Army and the Hessian Army for the Hessian commander, General Philip von Heister. Now, Solomon used this position to encourage Hessian desertions and to help other American prisoners to escape. So in 1778, the British arrested Solomon again, and this time they tortured him and they condemned him to death on the charge that he was acting under orders of General Washington to burn British warehouses and British ships. Now, these charges were probably true, but on August 11th of 1778, Solomon had some gold coins sewn into his clothing, and he used that money to bribe his way out of prison and to escape, and he fled across New Jersey to Philadelphia, and there he reestablished himself in business and restored his prodigious wealth. Almost all of the money that was advanced by France and Holland to the United States during the Revolutionary War passed through his hands, and much of it was paid on his own reputation and personal integrity. Soon the French government would appoint him as paymaster for all French troops in America, and Solomon's intelligence, talents, and implacable hatred of British tyranny earned him the confidence of the highest levels of the revolutionary leadership. By 1781, America's financial resources were utterly exhausted. Soldiers had not been paid in years, and their families were destitute, and mutiny was in the air. It was this time that two men stepped in. One was Robert Morris, the richest man in America, and the other was Chaim Solomon. And the two of them together brokered over 75 financial transactions that funded the rest of the Revolutionary War to its successful conclusion. Now it was Solomon who raised the $20,000 desperately needed to fund the French and American march to Yorktown and the surrender of the British Army under General Cornwallis. It was Solomon who raised over $650,000 much of it on his own reputation and credit for the American cause. That was an incredibly huge sum of money back then. After the Revolutionary War, the American economy was in a shambles, and the fledgling American government had no money with which to reimburse Solomon. Solomon's health, as I said before, was shattered by his time in the provost jail, and he died in 1785 at the age of 44, a penniless man, and was buried in an unmarked grave right here in this cemetery. He may have been a penniless man, but he was owed huge sums of money by the American government and other individuals, money that was never repaid. After the British evacuated New York in November of 1783, New York City grew and prospered as a financial center and as the capital of the brand new United States of America. But Newport, Rhode Island was not quite so fortunate. The three years of occupation by the British Army of Newport had devastated the city. Over 500 homes had been destroyed and the entire infrastructure of the port, all the piers and docks and port area had been torn up for firewood. For a five mile radius, there wasn't a single tree standing uh, from the center of the city. But although diminished, the congregation of the Turo Synagogue there still endured. In 1790, George Washington, then the brand new president of the United States, visited Newport. He did this to unite the country under the new constitution. And so he was greeted enthusiastically by the citizenry of 
Newport, including the uh, congregation at the Turo Synagogue. And Washington wrote a letter of gratitude back to that congregation uh, after that celebration on August of 18th of 1790. And here is Washington's letter. Gentlemen, while I receive with much satisfaction your address replete with expressions of affection and esteem, I rejoice in the opportunity of assuring you that I shall always retain a grateful remembrance of the cordial welcome I experienced in my visit to Newport from all classes of citizens. The reflection on the days of difficulty and danger which are past is rendered the more sweet from a consciousness that they are succeeded by days of uncommon prosperity and security. If we have wisdom to make the best use of the advantages with which we are now favored, we cannot fail under the just administration of a good government to become a great and a happy people. The citizens of the United States of America have a right to applaud themselves for having given to mankind examples of an enlarged and liberal policy, a policy worthy of imitation. All possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. It is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it was by the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoy the exercise of their inherent natural rights. For happily, the government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. It would be inconsistent with my frankness of my character not to avow that I am pleased with your favorable opinion of my administration and fervent wishes for my felicity. May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants, while everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree, and there shall be none to make him afraid. May the Father of all mercies scatter light and not darkness in our paths, and make us all in our several vocations useful here and in his own time and way, everlastingly happy. George Washington. We Americans of every creed enjoy our right of conscience and of faith as our own natural rights endowed by our Creator to us. And so, we beg no tolerance from anyone, and we respect no intolerance from anyone either. And so, as was stated in Leviticus over 3,000 years ago, as resounded from the Liberty Bell with jubilation, proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. That's our episode for today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, would you please share it with your children, your grandchildren, your family, and your friends. Feel free to comment. We love constructive criticism and polite comments, of course. Thank you so much for watching. God bless you.